This video was sponsored by Babbel, the world's number one language learning app. So you want to be a modern day Monopoly man? After all, why wouldn't you? Modern day Monopolists have so much power that they're basically the equivalent to kings and queens. They have all the money, influence, and control. Their revenue numbers exceed many nation states around the world, and they don't have to answer to anyone, not even Congress. Uh, yes or no answer. Do you believe that the Chinese government steals technology from US companies? I'm saying uh, I, I know of no case on um, ours where it occurred. Uh, Congressman, uh, uh, I have no first-hand knowledge of uh, any information stolen from Google. That's the thing I've read reports of uh, and, and but don't have uh, personal experience with. Monopolists are everything people fantasize about being a rich entrepreneur, but on crack. They're the true puppet masters. So Monopolis, here we come. Your first instinct is to model the old robber barons of the past like Rockefeller and Carnegie. Their approach was simple. Start a linear business where resources go in, products come out, and then you buy up the entire supply chain for that product. All the different parts to how oil was made to all the different parts to how oil was transported. Or in other words, they created a monopoly by buying up everything in an industry. The problem with this traditional route is that it's outdated. The public despised your guts. They had to do business with you, not because you were the best choice, but because you were the only choice, which led to a lot of resentment. And thanks to antitrust laws, even if you could buy your way to a monopoly today, those leeches in government are definitely going to dismantle you. Today's monopolists are much different and get around all these pitfalls. Instead of buying up more factories, it's all about acquiring more users. Sure, Zuckerberg, Bezos, Pachai all get their fair share of criticism these days, but it's not nearly as bad as the hatred the public had towards the old robber barons. And for the most part, they're idolized as the greatest entrepreneurs of their time. We still use their products not because it's the only choice we have, there are plenty of YouTube, Google, Facebook competitors popping up, but because YouTube, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter are still the best products in their categories. We collectively create these monopolies ourselves. Whereas the old monopolies force themselves down the throats of the masses, today's monopolies are enthusiastically built by the masses from the bottom up. The old monopolies grew from the economies of scale. As they grew and owned more of the means of production, their costs went down. The new monopolies, however, grow because the more people that are on Instagram, the better the experience is. With old monopolies, consumers wanted more competition. But with new monopolies, consumers actually sometimes agree with Rockefeller that competition maybe is a sin. Just like how all of us complain that there are too many streaming services to pay for. And how wouldn't it be nice if we just had a single streaming monopoly where all our shows and movies are located with one simple payment? So your souls, screw the old monopolists, let's join the ranks of the new monopolists. Maybe you're saying to yourself, well okay then, I'll just create a mobile app, a SaaS app, a website, or whatever. Although these are information and internet based businesses like Facebook, Google, and Amazon, that's where their similarities end. Anyone today can hire some cheap developers to clone your website or mobile app and offer the exact same product for less. But you can't exactly do that with a Google or Facebook and be able to compete on the same level right away. In fact, as the barrier for entry for these pure software businesses keep going down, pure software is slowly going to keep becoming more and more like modern day commodities, like selling wheat, corn, or barrels of oil. Or in other words, these linear and commodity businesses have no moat. No competitive advantage to protect you from the sin of competition. And because they have no moat and you can't just simply buy up the supply chain, linear and commodity businesses will never reach your monopoly dreams. We need a business model with something more, a kind of moat that doesn't rely on something somewhat random like a patented scientific discovery, yet can't be easily copied by disgusting competitors. Enter platforms. Platforms are the one thing that all these new age monopolists have in common. And the reason why these companies are so powerful and untouchable is because platforms offer something that can't be easily replicated. Networks. Amazon is a network that connects buyers and sellers. YouTube is a network that connects viewers and creators. Uber is a network that connects drivers and riders. Networks of users are the one thing that allows us to monopolize. Amazon's value doesn't come from their revolutionary technology that allows people to shop online. Millions of sites already do that. Amazon's value comes from the fact that it already has a network of millions of buyers and sellers that already trust the platform. Facebook's value doesn't come from the code that anyone can write by the way that allows people to see other people's posts on Facebook and Instagram. No, their value comes from the fact that practically everyone uses Facebook and Instagram. The mere fact that a lot of people you know are on it makes Facebook a lot more valuable. Users are interconnected, that is the whole point. College kids are online because their friends are online and if one domino goes, the other dominoes go. Amazon isn't the product, Facebook isn't the product, Google isn't the product, Uber isn't the product. The product is the other users themselves. This is called the network effect. 
Whereas more and more users interact with each other, the more value users get in return compared to the raw code itself. Facebook wouldn't be very useful to us if there was only 10 people on it, but 2.6 billion active users per month all interacting with each other? That's pretty valuable. Wanna create an Instagram competitor? Well, too bad. Even if you clone the exact code they use today and created a one-to-one -one copy, you still wouldn't be able to compete because without the other users, why would people leave an established network for one that has barely anyone on it? Most people want to stick to just one platform for each specific need, making your monopoly very hard to topple. Or in other words, whereas the old monopolists got their power from owning the means of production, the new monopolists get their power from owning the means of connection. Platforms also have the benefit of not having to produce anything. Instead, the users do all the producing and the platform just sits back and facilitates the trade. This allows expenses to not grow nearly as fast as revenue does, which means you can scale almost effortlessly compared to more plebeian businesses. What's better is that expenses start to level off as you get bigger instead of increasing linearly. Controlling networks is the safest, most sustainable, and most profitable way to go. Or in other words, platform entrepreneurs are the real modern day monopolists. But don't take my word for it. Out of the $126 billion private startups around the world in 2015, also known as unicorn companies, over half of them were platforms. The next Mark Zuckerberg, the next Jeff Bezos isn't going to build just another mobile app, just another SaaS app or a typical physical product, but a platform. And these are the secrets behind today's most powerful monopolists. And if you stick to the end, I'll share a future platform that hasn't been created yet, but instead of in the billion dollar range, it's in the trillion dollar range. When these laws were written, the monopolists were men named Rockefeller and Carnegie. Their control of the marketplace allowed them to do whatever it took to crush independent businesses and expand their own power. Well, the names have changed, but the story is the same. Today, the men are named Zuckerberg, Cook, Bichai, and Bezos. Their control of the marketplace allows them to do whatever it takes to crush independent business and expand their own power. At the end of the day, all a platform is is a network where producers and consumers can meet and exchange value. This can be free videos in exchange for ad revenue, views, and subscribers, or something more physical like money and ratings for a place to stay on Airbnb. Although platforms are pretty simple, building one and getting it off the ground is much harder than a traditional linear business where resources go in and goods come out. Building a linear business is pretty easy. There's already set frameworks you can borrow from, existing supply chains you can use, but there's no clear blueprint for building a platform because if there was, that particular platform would have already been built. So we gotta start from scratch. The first step in your monopolistic journey is picking the right market which is also pretty tricky. Since consumers like to stick to one or two platforms for every niche, like how ride sharing only has Uber and Lyft, the money is in finding a new niche where there isn't a dominant platform already, or competing in a brand new niche that a bunch of platforms are fighting over like the early days of the scooter wars. The niche also has to be big enough to support a network. The bigger the network, the more swipes can happen, the more ride requests can happen, the more views can happen, or in other words, the bigger the network, the more transactions can happen between those producers and consumers, and thus the more billions you can make. Once you find that Goldilocks market, if our money and power comes from more of those transactions happening that we just talked about, let's go over that next. The most important question you have to answer in your quest for your monopoly platform is what is the core transaction? Your dreams live and die by the core transaction. Basically, you have to ask why are people using this platform? In Tinder's case, it's to hook up with someone, so Tinder's core transaction is a simple swipe between users. In YouTube's case, it's for people to find entertainment, so YouTube's core transaction is producers make videos for consumers to consume in exchange for views, money, subscribers, etc. In fact, when you clicked on this video and when you smash the subscribe button and like button because it really helps out, we just completed YouTube's core transaction together. Give yourself a pat on the back. If the platform is the modern day factory, the core transaction is the assembly line. With the starting point being producers creating value or making it available to be consumed on the platform, also known as inventory, if producers stop producing, the rest of the assembly line can't function. Whether that be if creators stop making YouTube videos, people stop listing their real estate on Airbnb, etc. Step number two in our assembly line is a user connecting with another to spark that exchange. In Skype's case, the producer initiates the communication with another user that consumes it. In YouTube's case, it's consumers that spark the exchange when they click on a video. Step number three is simple. Once consumers find the right match, they consume the producer's inventory. And step number four, consumers give value back to the producer in exchange for what they consumed. 
And this doesn't have to be just money like we hinted at earlier. It can be reviews and ratings for platforms like Airbnb and Uber, or other non-monetary value like follower accounts, likes, comments, making it easier for the creator to reach more viewers in the future in the case of the YouTube algorithm, while also discouraging them from leaving the platform because look at all the subscribers I have, I can't leave. Whatever platform you think of, it all boils down to these four basic steps that act as the lifeblood for your network. The more core transactions on YouTube means the more ad revenue among other things for YouTube. More core transactions on Uber means more ride commissions for Uber. That's why it's so important to get each step as efficient as possible. Take Tinder for example, they understood that the core transaction of dating was a two-way street, that both parties need to be into each other before they start talking. So Tinder made that process as simple and efficient as possible. Before Tinder, a lot of dating sites made you send a message to someone you were interested in. This made men take the time to write messages to women that he didn't even know if they were interested in him, which resulted in a lot of disappointment. Women, on the other hand, ended up with a bunch of messages from men, most of whom she wasn't interested in. So Tinder optimized that core transaction to be just a simple swipe. If both parties swipe right on each other, then they would commit to talking. This allowed users to get through way more core transactions and skyrocketed them into the number one dating app, with over a billion dollars in revenue to show for it. Along with the assembly line of the core transaction, there are other things you need to do to make sure your network is healthy and thriving. The most important starting out is audience building. After all, the entire value of the network is that there's a lot of people on it. Not enough people and you don't get swiped, rides don't get booked, and everything falls apart. So it's all about attracting the right amount of both consumers and producers to maintain a balance between supply and demand. As the network gets bigger, it's going to get harder and harder to connect the right consumers with the right producers. This is where algorithms for matchmaking come in. Uber automatically picks the closest driver in the area, YouTube shows videos that get the most engagement, not just whichever get the most views, and Amazon looks at what products people typically buy together and get the right products in front of the right customer's eyes. Another problem you run into once your network gets big is preventing bad transactions, scammers, spammers, trolls, etc. This is where the all too important rules and standards come in. At this point, you're basically acting as the government of your platform, finding the right balance between safety and freedom for both consumers and producers. And lastly, another thing you can do to keep your network thriving is offering tools and services. This could be tools like filters on Instagram or the built-in video editor on YouTube, or it could be services like customer support, insurance for Uber drivers and Airbnb hosts or moderators. Basically, they're nice to have that add-on to the user's experience on the platform. Platforms are by far one of the hardest businesses to build today because you run into the chicken and egg problem. Networks are only as valuable as the users that make it up, but you have to start out with zero users. But if you get all these moving parts right, you find the right market with enough people, you design a great, simple, and efficient core transaction that producers and consumers can go through like Tinder swiping, you make sure your platform is healthy with audience building, matchmaking, rules and standards, tools and services, and you push through until you hit a point called critical mass, where there's enough people to justify new people to want to join things will start to snowball. You'll be able to start monetizing either via transaction fees, ads, optional monthly subscriptions, and you'll go from an unprofitable platform startup to skyrocketing into the ranks of the modern day monopolist. Now you may be saying to yourself, but Jake, all this sounds great in theory, but these platforms seem so far and few between. Are there even any markets left to build a platform on? Well, I'm glad you asked because there are still many markets to platformize. I just made up that word with the hardest one being space. But don't take my word for it, take it from Amazon's Jeff Bezos who also has his own space company, Blue Origin. Here's him talking about what's preventing us from colonizing space. There are going to be thousands of future companies doing this work. But those companies, those entrepreneurial companies cannot exist today. It's impossible. And the reason is there's no infrastructure. In 1994, I started Amazon. All of the heavy lifting infrastructure needed for Amazon to exist was already in place. We did not have to build a transportation system to deliver packages. We got to stand on top of that infrastructure. The same thing with payment system, did we have to invent a, a payment system and roll that out? That would have been billions of dollars in many decades. Did we have to deploy computers? No, they were already in most homes. Did we have to build a telecom network? That would have been billions of dollars. Infrastructure lets entrepreneurs do amazing things. Just like we lay the groundwork of the internet for people to build the age of information off of, we need to lay the groundwork, the platform for entrepreneurs to build up in space. And as we've learned, the ones who control the means of connection in space they're probably gonna be trillionaires. 
But aside from space, as you expand your platform monopoly here on Earth, you're gonna have to expand into international regions, maybe open up offices worldwide, or at bare minimum talk to people in different countries over the phone. And you're inevitably gonna run into people who might not be fluent in English. And if you really want to wow them, if you really want to get them to like you to do business with you, one of the most impactful things you can do to get them to instantly perk up is to speak their native tongue. Even just learning a few phrases like thank you in their language can get someone to see you in a brighter light. This is coming from personal experience. And it doesn't have to be business related either. It can be to help you win the love of your life or just to keep your brain flexible and agile. In Tamabedic with Amrik. Where did you learn to speak Arabic, Magnus? <laughs> Luckily for you, this is where Babbel comes in, the number one language learning app in the world. You can choose from 13 different languages, it has a 4 plus star rating from over 700,000 people on both the Google Play Store and the Apple Store, and Babbel is different from other learning methods because it gamifies language learning into a digestible fun time by preparing you for situations you'll actually encounter in real life. Merci. God damn it. <laughs> Merci. Merci. Messy. That was not. <laughs> With university studies showing that just 21 hours on Babbel equates to an entire semester of Spanish in college for just a tiny fraction of the cost. Which I can confirm, Babbel is way funner than traditional agonizing language courses. And for a limited time, Babbel is offering you aspiring monopolists 50% off 6 months so you can start learning a new language right now in bite-sized 10 to 15 minute chunks. So head to the link below right now to claim your 50% off for 6 months for a limited time only. Yes, I am well aware that I am but a mere producer on a platform, so does that make me a hypocrite? Well, yes, it does. So, we're working on it. This video was based on the book Modern Monopolies, which is a very great read if you want to learn more about this stuff. As you can see, we're not at the typical studio because we just got a new place in Newport Beach. So I'm still working out the lighting situation for the like talking head setup. But I didn't want to leave you guys hanging. So if you enjoyed this video, click that subscribe button for more videos just like this every single week on the most provocative and interesting stuff in the world of business. You can follow me on Instagram at jaketrend.io. That is going to wrap it up for this video, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. As always, stay dangerous, and I'll see you guys in the next one.